Well, next 15 minutes, I'm going to try to summarize briefly four topics that uh, are loosely related. And they're related as part of a project that we proposed a few weeks ago that would um, gather data that are collected with automated systems in the field, data related to the water cycle, bring them together in one place, analyze them, document them, archive them, and make them available to users in near real time. So starting with the hydrological measurements, first a little bit of geography. Here's them, we're in the Snake River watershed, and here Prospect Hill, we're actually on the boundary of two major sub-basins, the Miller's River to the north and the Chicopee River to the south. Here's a map of the Prospect Hill track. You can see the gauge watersheds that we put in a few years ago. Um, two small headwater streams, Nelson Brook here, which includes the Blackcomb Swamp, the stream drains into the Miller's River and the Ziggolo Brook River, which includes the, big, the Beaver Swamp and the Lower Watershed. Uh, Bigelow Brook drains into the Swift River, which, as you know, was dammed up 80 years ago to form the Quabbin Reservoir, which is the source of drinking water for Metropolitan Boston. About five miles downstream from our cages, there's a long term USGS cage on the east branch of the Swift River where it enters the what's now the Bobbin Reservoir. So most of our effort in recent years, we put in the gauges just a few years ago, our efforts have focused on setting up a program <coughs> of reliable long-term measurements that can serve to support other projects, just like the data from the weather station. But we have enough data now to begin to look at some interesting <coughs> questions in hydrology. I'm going to just mention a few here that are related to water, but for each one of them, there are also interesting biogeochemical and aquatic ecology questions. So one question is, how do these systems, and these are very small forest watersheds, how do they respond to short-term variations in precipitation? So here's a hydrograph from the upper Bigelow watershed. This is uh, 24 hectares, no wetlands, very flashy. And this shows discharge on the log scale as a function of time. And over these three years, we've seen some remarkable variation in precipitation. So the year 2008, you can see this the usual um, seasonal cycle in the fall. <coughs> this was the weather that you're on record in Harbor Forest. We had a tropical storm in the late summer. In 2009, this was about an average year in terms of annual precip, but it was extremely wet during the summer, so there was no characteristic summer dip. In 2010, it was a little bit below average in terms of annual precip, but very, very dry in late summer and early fall. So this stream, which normally flows continuously, would dry a few times. And then in the beginning of 2011, as we all know, we've had an unusual amount of snow, a very deep snowpack. And these data run through last Monday and the beginnings of the spring flood here. Also shown are data from our snow pillow, which we put in a year ago. And this is the uh, snow water equivalent. It's the water content of the snowpack as a function of time. So this shows the water storage in last winter and the water storage this winter uh, to date. And you can see as often happens during midwinter, the hydrograph kind of levels off as most of the input moisture is going into storage in the snowpack, which is then released as the snow melts in the spring with a corresponding increase in flow. We also put gauges in a couple years ago on the two big wetlands. And we can see right away that the wetlands serve as we expected to buffer storm flow as it moves downstream. It's like a small floodplain. But it's also interesting to note that under normal conditions, the water level on these two wetlands doesn't vary very much. It's in a range of about 20 centimeters. But when you have extremely dry conditions, like we had in the last summer and early fall, uh, the flow in the stream stops altogether, but we still get useful information from these bottom gauges. So, in both cases, the water level dropped almost 60 centimeters and then came back up quickly when it began to rain again in September. One of the interesting long term questions is whether we can balance the water budget for these small watersheds using the measurements that we're making now and other measurements that we might make in the future. So this is a preliminary first cut, but I just want to show you the kind of analysis that we could try to do in the future. These are monthly data, and we would expect from a system of this kind that the major 
losses of water will be surface runoff and evapotranspiration. So and the, these are for two watersheds, Upper Bigelow and Nelson. The blue bars show the runoff as a yield. So at the stream gauges, we measure volume of water that goes by the gauge per unit time. If you imagine that volume of water is spread out evenly across the watershed, and you measure the height of that body of water, that would be the yield. And then I've done a, a kind of crude gap filling uh, process on data, ET data from the Hemlock Tower and the Little Prospect Hill Tower to get a rough estimate of evapotranspiration. I'm sure those numbers can be improved a bit, but it gives you some idea of, of the seasonal cycle and the difference in the two forest types, as Julian has, has told us. So if we add these two together, that is the yield and the uh, losses to yield, losses to evapotranspiration, and we subtract it from the primary inputs, which is precipitation, again on a monthly scale, we can get uh, values that look something like this. And again, this is preliminary, but this is kind of what we'd expect, that sometimes the values will be positive, sometimes negative. We think we would guess in part at least that these values correspond to changes in storage of the system. So we could uh, fine tune this, for example, by looking at what we know about the water that's going into or out of the snowpack on a month by month basis. But we can also add these up over a period of time. So if you add up these values over a period of years, we would expect the pluses <coughs> in storage to eventually cancel out. And that might tell us something about whether there are other inputs or outputs to the system. And if we do that here, and again, these are preliminary numbers in 2008, 2009, were very wet years. But what we find is that the um, input precipitation exceeds outputs by about 15%. And that's not entirely surprising. We would expect in watersheds like these that there would be some loss out the bottom, either elevated watersheds, uh, bedrock has cracks in it, so probably some water is being lost in an unknown amount coming out at the lower elevation. <coughs> It's also quite likely that there's some loss of water uh, moving subsurface down through the soil that's not being measured at the gauge. So those are two important factors that are difficult to measure directly. This kind of analysis can give us a rough estimate of how, how much that is. And we could also uh, try to measure that directly. There are techniques for doing that with groundwater wells and thermometers that we might want to pursue in the future. One last question, uh, which is how does water yield respond to longer term changes of um, climate and land use? And this is a, an interesting question. There's actually a working group in the Health Care Network that's looking at this question now in a number of different regions around the country, including ours. And for this, we need some longer term data sets. So here on the left, we have nearly 50 years of data from the Harbor Forest on uh, daily temperature and precipitation. And we are, in fact, seeing evidence of an increase in both as predicted by the climate models. Over here is annual discharge at that gauge I mentioned, the USGS gauge on the east branch of the Swift River, where we have about 75 years of data. And here, too, there's evidence for, for a slight increase over time. So this is an interesting question, because on the one hand, these watersheds have reforested to some degree over that period of time. Mm -hmm. And that would tend to decrease yield in most cases. But at the same time, it looks like precipitation inputs may be increasing, which would tend to increase yield. So it's an interesting problem to try to tease apart those two and perhaps other uh, effects on water yield. This is also a chance to look at extreme events and the possible change in those over time. So for example, this is peak flow, peak flow events at the same gauge, 1938 hurricane, probably once in 100 years. This was a week ago Monday. <laughs> Second topic, field wireless network. Um, as most of you know, um, this has been in place and operational for about a year now. This is something we said we would do in the last LTR proposal, and has in fact come to pass. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this provides high-speed internet access to experimental sites across the Prospect Hill Track. Um, it was developed as an extension of the Harvard University Network, so it's jointly managed by us and by Harvard Network Operations provides full internet access for folks who are here. We have Wi-Fi, so you see these red circles. You can also come into this network, it's a private network, but you can come in using VPN, as some of the researchers here do in Hong Kong. 
So we have a, a lot of equipment and a growing list of equipment that's installed here. Uh, this is available for you. We have plenty of bandwidth. Let us know. It's not for watching Netflix out of the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell your audience because I think you do that. <laughs> but it is for research and education. By all means, let us know if you'd like to make use of it. In the coming year, as you know, Neon is on the horizon, we hope, we think. So we have been in discussion with them over the past year about improvements to the electrical service to the EMS area where the new Neon Tower is planning to go. The cable that's there is more than 20 years old and certainly will not last for another 30 years. So what we have proposed to Neon is to replace it with a new cable and then extend that up to the Upper Bigelow Gate. This is very high voltage, 8,000 volt cable. And what we propose is to actually bury two, one that's energized, one that's a spare. So this will, these negotiations will proceed over the coming year. If this does come to pass, we've also proposed to put in either transformers or transformer pads every 600 feet. Um, this will provide an opportunity to get line power to our hydrological gauges, which will make the maintenance of them so much easier, but also make it possible for us to add them to the field wireless network. If we can do that, we'll make the data available in real time as we've done with our meteorological station in many years. <coughs> I'll just mention this project in passing, but this is a long standing project here, more than 10 years. It involves Aaron and me, and David and others, and which we've been working with computer scientists over at UMass Amherst and at Montmoyo College. And what we're trying to do in a nutshell is develop methods and tools that make it possible for scientific data analysis to be completely reproducible. So that's easy to say in one sense, and not so easy to actually do it. It's a very interesting and challenging problem in computer science. And so we've taken as our, our case um, example, the, the example of breeding in um, data on a sensor network and processing those data <coughs> and post-processing them as, as necessary after that. And so this is our working example. And we think the solution to this problem lies in the creation of two mathematical graphs, one called a process definition graph that defines any sort of processes, any kind of analysis that you might do, for example, defines it in general terms, but quite rigorously. And then the second graph, the data derivation graph, that um, documents exactly what was done in the execution of the process in one particular instance, with a complete lineage of all the data objects and a complete lineage of all the control features. Finally, last topic, information management, is a hallmark of the LTR program and something that LTR reviewers take extremely seriously, so we do too. So these are outlines of some of the things that we've done in the current LTR cycle to try to move this forward. One of the biggest ones is this. Um, our metadata are stored in a special markup language called EML for Ecological Metadata Language. And we worked in the last couple of years to go back through and update all of our metadata down to the individual variable level. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but it took us almost a year to do it, but it has been done. We've been able to bring all of our data sets up to date. This is something you may not see as a user, but um, our DML files are now managed on the server end by an open source XML database called Exist, which is extremely powerful and makes it very easy to, to make uh, online searches available to users. One of the things we've done with Exist is also to enter our publications, and so we've added links to each of our data set pages to relevant publications. Take a look at yours sometime when you have a chance. If you're not seeing publications that you should, let us know, we'll update them for you. And as most of you know, we've also made this requirement that you submit data in order to get research projects approved. Speaking of which, we'll be looking for your 2008 data, if we don't have them yet, before we can approve your projects for this coming field season. Some goals for LTR5. We're working right now at developing a link to spatial maps, a Google type, Google Earth type maps, so that in addition to the publications links, there'll be a map link. You'll be able to go right to a map that will show you where your project is located in the map. We're planning to implement a new control vocabulary that's been developed in LTR to replace the keywords that we currently have and improve searches. We want to develop and improve techniques for um, improved quality control. One of the long-term, one of the things that's going to happen in the, in the next cycle is 
the implementation of a network information system and our participation in it, which will require that the data and the metadata for all of our projects be closely in agreement. And finally, um, we, may, we may go in this direction, we haven't yet, um, but we've clearly developed database capability for some of our larger data sets in the addition of more GIS data. So I think you might have time. I, here's some ideas for where we might go. And <coughs> thank all the many people working on this project.